Hi, my name is Debbie Dell, and Jesus is my Savior and Healer. Recently, I was having issues with sudden onset flashing in my right eye that just wouldn't stop. I went to my optometrist, and he took some tests in my eye and stated that my retina, well, his medical term for it was iffy, and referred me to an ophthalmologist. Last Wednesday night, Pastor Shane prayed for me after service, and I really felt the touch of the Holy Spirit. That night, after prayer, the flashing had stopped. I went to the ophthalmologist this Thursday for the follow-up, and they did a new set of tests, and they did a compare, and the doctor told me that my retina looked great, and I had no restrictions. He wants me to come back in about two to three months to confirm, but he said my eyes look good. I believe the healing was confirmed, and God is so good, and he is truly my healer. Why don't we stand together as we worship. Good morning, Church of the Front Range. If you're a guest with us, a special welcome to you. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, spending this time together. and. Uh, something that the Lord just put in our hearts as we were praying uh, for you guys and for the service this morning is that the enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but God comes to bring life and life abundantly. And part of the way that he steals that I don't think we think about often is he is out to steal God's worship. He's actually out to rob God of the glory that is due his name. And so if you kind of think like I've showed up today and, and I want to pour my heart out like a, like a drink offering to the Lord. Well, every little drop that he can steal, he is very thrilled about. And if you have been to church much in your life, you're probably going to resonate with this. Have you ever noticed that during worship, all of a sudden, it's like your mind gets barraged with everything someone did wrong to you. It's like, where is that coming from? You have to understand that's the enemy. He is trying to steal the worship. Have you ever noticed that if you show up and you got a headache or you've got like, you know, some aches and pains and all of a sudden they get worse, you know, when Sunday morning comes around, you have to understand it's the enemy. He's out to distract. He's out to take away. And so I'm going to encourage us this morning, no matter what uh, is happening, to just keep our eyes fixed on him. Let's bring him 100 percent. Let's just be determined. We're not going to let the enemy steal a single drop, a single ounce of the praise that God is due. I'm going to bring it all to him. And God is we come, we just fix our eyes up on you. God, as I worship, I like to think that, Father, like you're like a, on the throne and to your right is the Son and to your left is the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, church, even as I look up, I just imagine like my, my eyes and my head are pointed toward the, the throne of the Father and my left hand is being lifted up to the Son at his right and my right hand is being lifted up to praise the Holy Spirit who's to his left. And God, we want to bring you an offering to love you with all of our minds, keeping our minds fixed on you. God, we pray for strength not to allow the enemy to distract us. We're focused on you and we want to love you with all of our hearts, God. We want to pour out all of our love and all of our devotion and all of our affection on you this morning for you are worthy. And we want to love you with all of our strength, God. We know that your word calls us to use our bodies in worship. And so, God, we want to use our bodies in worship. We want to sing to you with full voice. And, God, we pray that this would be a time when holy hands would be lifted up to you, where hands would clap to you, where voices would shout, testifying to your victory, God. We're praying this would be a time when bodies would dance because you have filled us with joy and Knees would bow, faces would be prostrate before you, all the ways that you call us to worship you in your word. You are worthy of every single one. May no offering be withheld from you in this place, in this house this morning. And God, we want to worship you with all of our wills. There is a worship of the will, church, that we worship God because of who we know he is, even when we don't feel like it. Some of your caffeine may not have kicked in just yet. It's okay. God's the same. He doesn't change based on how you're feeling this morning. And so, God, we want to worship you with all of our will, obeying you fully, bringing you all the honor and glory that you are due. And, God, if we could be so humble and so bold as to ask, Lord, we are praying that you would fill us and fill our hearts and fill this house with your Holy Spirit this morning. 
We want to know you and we want to have an encounter with you. We want to walk with you and we want to be with you. You're the one that we love. and We pray this in Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen.
perfect love will not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? I'm resurrected King. I surrendered you to be here. Just want you, your pardon, your 
his heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me king of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth Thank you today. Your word says in Psalm 147 that that you name the stars. And in the very next verse it says that he's close to the brokenhearted. And so we see right there in that passage that the same one who named every single star in the universe is right here next to you wherever you're at it's the same the same god right here with us now and father we thank you right now that we have access to you that we can be with you we feel your presence in this room right now and the only proper way to respond is to give you all the worship and all the praise with everything inside of us and that's what we choose to do right now thankful today and as we open your word would you speak give us eyes to see ears to hear we love you we honor you in Jesus name we pray and the church said 
Amen, amen. It's so good to be with you guys this, this morning. Why don't you take a moment, meet a few people that you don't know, and then you can find a seat. We'll continue with a service. Well, it's good to worship with you guys. Uh, way to go, church. I, I do feel like you, we uh, pushed through the focus wars, right? You tracking with me? Okay, we did it. Thank you, Lord. So uh, welcome this weekend, and it's baptism weekend. So you chose a great weekend to be here. We're very excited. Uh, yeah, we're going to celebrate baptisms at the end of uh, the service today. Um, but first, of course, we're going to open up the scriptures together. But some announcements uh, before we do this, uh, summer being right around the corner, we're going to be resurrecting this second summer of Church of the Front Range, Summer Nights. And so we've got our first Summer Night coming up on Wednesday night, June 1st. What are Summer Nights? It's just a time to, we get together on the patio, weather, will, weather willing, and uh, we'll enjoy some food. We hang out. It's nothing formal. Uh, it's just a time of connecting, meeting some people, things like that. So I encourage you to come on out Wednesday, June 1st. That's going to be at 5.15 p.m. Um, and it's not going to conflict with small groups because our summer schedule for small groups is going to be uh, twice a month instead of every week. So the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month, we will have small groups in the gym as usual uh, before the Wednesday night service time. Uh, but on this particular uh, Wednesday night, June 1st, we're going to have a summer night. So in addition to what the adults will be doing, we're also going to have uh, things happening for the children. So indoor carnival games in here led by our kids ministry team uh, and all of that. So please check your kids in uh, around 515 and they will get started. If you'd be willing to RSVP, if you're going to check kids in, this would help the kids ministry team prepare uh, for how many are coming. You can just go to the home page of our website and let us know in that way. Uh, and for adults, we'll be eating outside at, starting at 515 and of course service begins here at 7. Also wanted to catch you up. If you missed last weekend, uh, we shared a really exciting announcement uh, about Revival Week coming up this summer in August. Uh, what is Revival Week? Yeah, we got some excited people out there. Uh, as a church, we have a calling to pursue God for revival. What's revival? It's just a mass acceleration of the kingdom of God, where the out are swept into the household of faith and the in are revived up and the, the up are empowered and sent out uh, all in an unprecedented rate. And so this pursuit is at the heart of who we are as a people, as a church. We believe God for revival. We pursue him uh, for revival year around, uh, as Second Chronicles 7.14 calls us to do, to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek his face, to repent, and turn toward him. Uh, so we do this year round, but there are times when we devote some increased time to seeking God and seeking God for a move of God. And so this summer is going to be one of those times. Just after school starts, uh, we're going to be hosting what we call Revival Week. That's Monday, August 15th through Thursday, August 18th. Each evening that week, a full-on Revival Week, we've got four incredibly anointed and spirit-filled guest teachers that are lined up that week. Christine Kane, R.T. Kendall, Manning Leapshire, and Tommy Tenney. So more to come as the dates approach, but we wanted you to know in advance so that you could hold those dates, pencil those dates in August 15th to 18th. So thank you guys for listening to that, and now let me say welcome back to our weekend series called Titans and Tidal Waves. Why do we have a series called Titans and Tidal Waves? Uh, a little backstory on this. One of the words that God has spoken over our church is that he would raise up titans of the faith uh, here through this uh, church family. And so uh, that is part of where we get this title titans from. So like if you're visiting and you're kind of feeling like, you know, this doesn't feel like a very casual version of Christianity when I come to Church of the Front Range, or maybe it doesn't even feel like that, like, hey, you know, Christianity will complement my otherwise great life kind of Christianity. You might even feel like this is even beyond challenging, and well, that's why. Um, we believe that biblical Christianity is a cross-carrying Christianity. It's a costly Christianity. It is a lay down your life for the one who laid down his life for you Christianity. It's a lose your life in order to find your life Christianity. And so we are after a revolution that returns to its roots and one that raises up titans of the faith. 
And so we're talking about titans and tidal waves because there are a number of cultural tidal waves that have been and are coming that many believers are getting swept off their feet of faith by. And so far in this series, we've taken on the cultural tidal waves of security, seeking and seeing the source of security as being outside of God. There's a lot of fortifying around those other alternative sources. Second tidal wave is that of achievement. We live in a culture that idolizes achievement in the things of this world at the neglect of living for eternal achievement. And then last week was about parenting by conformity rather than by conviction. It's about getting off course and raising up the next generation by blessing what is not of God rather than blessing what is of God. And today we're taking on another tidal wave whose swell has really surged in the last few years. And the more it has swelled, the more afraid many believers have become to speak the truth or to stand up for the truth knowing the potential cost of doing so. We are talking about cancel culture this weekend. How many of you are familiar with the idea of cancel culture? Well, familiarity with this varies. Uh, its definition is also uh, debated, and so is its function debated. But generally, cancel culture would be defined as the practice or tendency of engaging in mass canceling as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. So how should we think about cancel culture? Is this an effective tool? Is this a, a harmful weapon? Uh, is this accountability? Or is this actually censorship? Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it right? Is it wrong? And if it wasn't this way, then how would we engage? How should we engage in things that are off or maybe uh, offensive in culture? And how should we respond if we find ourselves also in the crosshairs of cancel culture. As we engage this tidal wave, we do need to recognize that cancel culture is not in fact new, although it's a new label. It's simply a new twist on an old tactic. This is something that people have tried to do throughout time, especially to God's prophets as recorded in the scripture. Oh, they were canceled big time. This is something that people have sought to do throughout time to God himself as well. It's not that anyone can actually cancel God, but it doesn't mean that people haven't tried. So what do we do with this whole cancel culture thing? Because we, we know inherently that there's a place for challenging, right? There's a place for pushing back in life. We also know that there's something about canceling that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem right. And what we are going to see today is that uh, you and I have no business canceling anybody. Uh, cancel culture, by and large, rejects the doctrine of creation, that man is created in the image of God. To cancel, it means to abolish or to attempt to make void. Now, doing that to what God created, what would we normally call that? Murder. That's what we would normally, even if it's murder by mouth, that's what it's doing. At the same time, we also know that because of the fall, those that are created in the image of God also need to be challenged and, yes, corrected and, and yes, even called out from time to time. But that's different than seeking to cancel out what God has created in his image. So what does the attempt to cancel show? I mean, you really have to have two things if you're going to cancel something. You've got to have ownership and you have to have authority. You know, credit cards can be canceled. Club memberships can be canceled. Subscriptions can be canceled. Oh, it's very hard to do, but it's actually possible. All these things can be canceled. God's creation, however, cannot be canceled. Because who has the right to cancel a creation? Can one creation equal to another cancel the other? Or can a creation cancel its creator? No, only the creator has that right. Only the creator has that power. So how do we know the difference between challenging someone in a biblical way and canceling someone in an unbiblical way? Uh, we're going to talk about that. And at the very end, we're also going to talk about what do you do if you become the one others are trying to cancel. Now, no one was canceled more than Christ. And so we're going to actually look at his life to understand and differentiate the difference between challenging and canceling today. So what was Jesus known for, right? He's known for his kindness. He was known for so much compassion. Jesus was known for so much good. He cared for the least. He cared for the lost. He, he ran to the marginalized. Matthew 9, 36, seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them. 
because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus went ashore and he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them and he healed their sick. Matthew 20, 34, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and they followed him. So what kind of reception would we imagine someone like him, like Jesus, would have? Well, I think we would expect that he would be loved and he would be embraced by everybody. But that wasn't really the case, was it? Time and time again, we actually read John 5, 18, for this reason they were trying to kill him because he said. And we know ultimately what they did. They ultimately killed him. And those that came against Christ to cancel him in the most extreme form, they, they said, well, we're fighting for orthodoxy, right? What they said about what they were doing is like, hey, we're, we're trying to do the right thing. Like this man's a heretic. This man's a blasphemer. And on and on they went. They were clearly doing what was wrong, but they said they were doing what was right. So how do we know the difference? Let's just break down the difference between challenging, biblically canceling in an unbiblical way. The first difference between challenging and canceling is that one targets the issue while the other targets the person. Whenever they came to Jesus, were they targeting a person or were they targeting an issue? Well, they said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Are they addressing an issue here? I mean, they're calling Jesus Satan possessed and they're attributing the miracles that God is doing through him to the devil. And of course, Jesus then explains that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the one unforgivable sin, the thing that they just did. So it sucks to be them. But nevertheless, let's just, I think that's funny, but contrast that with Jesus' interaction with so many people. Like this is what they did to him. They're after the person. But contrast this with what Jesus did. His interactions with so many, including Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was looked down upon. He was despised by so many people. And when Jesus comes to where Zacchaeus is, with all these people around, all these people looking, what does Jesus do? He doesn't attack him. He doesn't assault him. He doesn't insult him. Jesus actually invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. Knowing full well who he was and knowing full well the reputation that he had, and by inviting himself to have dinner at Zacchaeus' house, what's Jesus doing? He's making it known to him that forgiveness is possible for you. Something I don't think Zacchaeus probably thought was really true. And Zacchaeus, we know, heard that message loud and clear because before Jesus even got to his house for the appetizers, Zacchaeus repented of everything that he had extorted and said he was going to pay back everyone 4x what he had taken from them. See, Jesus didn't attack the person, but he did address the issue so often. Jesus is interacting with people. He could have easily ridiculed. He could have, you know, put all their sins and failures and shortcomings on the, on the big screen. Whether it was Zacchaeus or it was someone else or it was the, the woman at the well or whoever. Jesus addressed the issue. Yes, he did address their behaviors, but he didn't attack the person. Now, of course, there were times, and you might be thinking, where Jesus did kind of call names. Right? Brood of vipers comes to mind, whitewashed tomb, hypocrites. There were times that Jesus called names. Now, if you're thinking of those, you're probably also thinking, well, doesn't that kind of go against what you just said? Uh, well, not so fast. Real quick on this. Who did Jesus call names? It wasn't the lost. It was not the lame. And it was not the least. It was not those who were sick. And it wasn't people that knew that they were stained by sin. It was the scribes and it was the Pharisees, okay? In every case, it was those who refused to see or acknowledge their own sin, so much so that their only hope was to be shaken sternly into sanity for the sake of their own eternity. In every case, Jesus' words are also not just like general words of condemnation, whatever nasty thing came to his mind at the moment that he laid eyes on them. These are not names that communicated no worth, that communicated no value. They're not names that sent the anti-message of who God made them to be in his image. No, it was specific to the thing that was keeping them from God. That's the very thing he said. It gave them direction for how to repent, how to be restored to God. Jesus never used this strategy on those who were aware of their own sin. 
Just pay attention to that. And let's not forget, he also is Jesus. So we should just avoid names altogether. Can we get an amen? Amen. Okay. Second way we know the difference between challenging and canceling is the goal of each. So the goal of a challenge is to expose error. The goal of a cancel is to shame, to silence. So one is about getting to see, the other is about silencing. Just pay attention. The nature of persecution is to silence. You know, those people who say, let's preach the gospel and only, if necessary, use words have found a very convenient way to live out their faith and avoid being persecuted. Because nobody minds you doing good deeds. Some might mind you not participating in their bad deeds, but nobody ever got persecuted for anything other than what they said and the message they sent. It's the words that are a threat. Because good actions without words, anybody can interpret any way they want. Oh, he's a nice guy. Oh, she's such a good person. Oh, karma must have come my way today. You know, whatever. They'll just interpret it through whatever worldview, whatever lens they have. Words are different. John 10, 32 and 33, Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for a good work, we do not stone you. You see, it wasn't the deed. It was what was said. The prophets were not killed for what they did. It was for what they said. Jesus was not killed for what he did. It's for what he said. Stephen was not killed for what he did. It was for what he said. Canceling exists to shame someone into silence, okay? Biblical challenge exists to expose error so that a person has the opportunity to turn from that error. I have a good friend of mine. He works for a company, and I think he's really modeling this well. He's not trying to silence, but he is trying to challenge and expose error. This company has gone all in with pushing an anti-Christian worldview into uh, the workplace. My friend is telling me about what he has been saying to uh, his superiors about it. He said, so you guys are going to tell me it's fine for some people to go around and say every, all their moral philosophies about what they think is right and what they think is wrong. And not only are they allowed to do that, but if anyone disagreed with them, they're going to be shamed and they're going to be shunned. But if a Christian, or frankly almost any religion, was to actually speak about what they believe and why they believe it in terms of morality and things like that, that's not allowed. Is that what you're telling me? I think that's a pretty good example of challenging but not trying to silence. He's not trying to shut other people up. He's not trying to silence other people. He's simply exposing the error. And he's advocating. It's like, let everybody share what they think then. Let everyone share why uh, they believe what they believe without fear, not just some people. Challenge exposes error. Cancel seeks to silence. He'll probably get fired too, but nevertheless. Um, what's the third difference between challenging and canceling? Well, challenging will leverage the truth, whereas canceling will leverage the crowd. You're going to see that a lot in Scripture. Those that are out to cancel, they are cowards. And they use crowds to accomplish the silencing that they seek. Mark 15, 11, the chief priest stirred up the crowd. Acts 21, 27, when the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd. Now, Jesus, he is so secure in the truth. He spoke the truth. He stood on the truth. Even when he was alone and was all alone in speaking it, he, he spoke the truth. Jesus leveraged the truth. By contrast, insecure people turn to mobs and they turn to masses. When they don't have the truth within, which strengthens them, they look for the masses to push them from behind and to hold them up. Jesus' priority was always to bring people to God. And so he leveraged truth. Their priority was people's praise. And so they leveraged the crowds. Even Pilate knew it wasn't truth, what they were bringing. Three times Pilate recognized what they were doing, that they had stirred up the crowd. Three times he said, I see no offense in him. Pay attention. Those who rally mobs, organize mobs, rely on masses to accomplish their purposes, that's cancel. That is not biblical challenge. One time I was leading a serving trip in Africa, and I think this illustrates this. I, we showed up to serve, and uh, we'd been there many days to serve in this uh, very, very little, like, very impoverished, small village. 
And across the town, I could see this big, smoky fire going up and, and just tons, hundreds of people just gathered around this fire. And it's, it's pretty early in the morning, and I'm like, what in the world's going on? So I kind of leave our team to go and find out what's happening, and I discovered that uh, reportedly a man in the village had assaulted someone the night before. The villagers caught wind. They went and grabbed him that morning. They stuck a tire around and poured kerosene on it, and they lit a match. And they were all just standing around watching this guy burn. That's mob justice. And this happens in many places in the world, and just underdeveloped countries of the world in particular. In Pakistan, this happens. The anti-blasphemy laws are in action there. So if someone's overheard speaking uh, against Islam or against Muhammad, well, the mob can, and they often do, surround and they kill the person just instantly. And as long as that they can prove that, what the, that the person actually said something negative about Muhammad or about Islam, then they'll be totally vindicated for what they did, bypassing any sort of courts or it's like it's totally fair game, mob justice. Now, biblically, God gives government and he gives judicial systems authority of the sword in order to bring justice. He does not permit us taking vengeance into our own hands. We rely on God, but he does give government and authority as a means of his justice being executed. But there's many places today that are not impacted by biblical standards of justice. In Nepal, same thing. A man became a Christian, the villagers led by the Buddhist monk himself, they executed him. There's no government involved. There's no court. It's just mob justice. I was once in India a number of years ago, saw the same thing. A truck driver, he had ran into someone on the street. I don't know how anyone doesn't run into everyone on those streets. But somebody said that his breath smelled of alcohol. They pulled him out of the cab of the truck. They surrounded him. They beat this guy within an inch of his life. Just instant mob justice. Now, can you just imagine if a Christian was participating in something like that, mob justice? Like, would that be fitting for those who call upon the name of Christ? No. But do we recognize that is what cancel culture is in our society? It's mob justice. It's mob murder, but with the mouth. It's what's happening. Christian, we don't have permission from God to bring justice on ourselves. And unless we are in the authority and following the channels of authority, we don't have the right to participate in that kind of mob justice either. That is not the way of those who follow Christ. Do not think that what happens online is any less barbaric and unfitting for the sons and daughters of God to be participating in. It's not. We leverage the truth. We do not leverage masses. One thing that bothers me greatly is all the websites and all the podcasts that exist solely to take down Christian ministers. It's like a, a real trend, have you noticed? It's like all the rage these days. It's just a bunch of secondhand information to accuse and malign and to cancel them. I mean, if there's a public record of something that someone has said, you know, to quote them precisely, to address what they said, listen, that's very different than dogpiling a bunch of people who on top of things that are suspicious or jealous or maybe just don't like somebody. And don't ever be so naive as to believe that the motivations of men are that pure. Be more discerning. Trying to get everyone on board to target someone and take them out is very different than addressing theological error or differences or using appropriate venues to address concerns when the person, him or herself, is the concern. Now, I do need to say a little caveat before we move on past this point about le leveraging truth or leveraging the crowd. This does not mean that you, as an American, cannot garner support for a political position or policy. Why is that? Just to make sure we understand this. It's because in our country, that is the established authority, and that's the established process. Policy is directed and it's implemented by majority vote. And that's not anti-authoritarian. That's not trying to use numbers uh, in order to, you know, as the power to bully or to intimidate. It's getting people to actually use their legal rights responsibly. Because in our government, the job of the government is to represent the people, to enact the will of the people. So having an accurate reflection of the populace, that is important. That's the way things are set up here. It's a democracy, okay? That's different 
from applying pressure on non-elected, non-democratic persons and institutions through illegitimate and unauthorized channels to get someone canceled. So hopefully we can recognize that difference and hopefully this helps in dis distinguishing the two. The fifth difference between challenge and cancel is that biblical challenge addresses privately, whereas cancel culture addresses publicly. Biblical access to a person is only for those who have access. Biblical address to a person, I should say, is only for those who have access. It actually requires personal private address. Many people have been misreading uh, a particular scripture, uh, at least from our generation, and they do it in order to excuse, uh, as, to give themselves an excuse, as, excuse, I should say, to publicly say whatever they want about others, but mainly public figures, just broadcasting things as far and wide as they can. And the way they will do it is they'll say, well, that's what John the Baptist did with Herod. You know, John the Baptist was a prophet and he confronted Herod, you know, for the wrongs he was doing. Well, let's just look at this. What actually did John the Baptist say? Mark 6, 18, John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Two things we need to catch here. One, John said this literally to Herod. He said it to Herod, not about Herod to everybody else. John actually had an audience with Herod. Did you catch that? He said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He's not saying it's not lawful for him to have his. He's talking to him. He is not talking about him. Verse 20 says that Herod used to enjoy listening to John. You do realize they didn't have the radio back then. This tells us that John had the ear of Herod. He used, he used that proximity and he used that opportunity to speak directly to him. Second, what did he say? He said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. What name did John call Herod? None. What accusations and aspersions? None. Biblically, we speak about issues, yes, publicly, but we address persons privately if we have access in that person's life, which means you can let yourself off the hook from needing to be the personal confronter of every single human being alive. If, if God hasn't given you access, it's not in your hands, okay? It doesn't mean that there's never a time that we, we engage in, in some kind of combat, maybe even some kind of conflict with someone publicly. It doesn't mean that that never happens. It should be rare, but it doesn't mean it never happens. So like, if someone's just kind of, you know, Blabbering their own personal views, whatever, that's one thing. But if what they're saying has public impact, that is a time that you would address it publicly. Okay, so for example, maybe someone's trying to write a school curriculum. And that curriculum is going to be imposed on your kid. And it's going to be imposed on other people's kids. It, that's a time you would combat publicly because it's a public matter. And it has public implications. But when we do that, we combat the ideas we do not combat the person. We're gonna go after concepts, we're not gonna go after character. We're gonna debate ideas with truth, but we're not gonna attack persons. One other way to discern whether something is challenging or whether something is canceling, a challenge will be driven by God's will, a cancel is gonna be driven by personal vengeance, by personal offense. Pilate was able to discern what was driving the cancel culture of the first century, Matthew 27, 18, Pilate knew that it was because of envy that the religious leaders had handed Jesus over. You compare that to Jesus, he's not being driven by personal offense, he's being driven by the will of God. He spoke truth to bring about God's will, and even when it cost them, he did not retaliate. They were driven by personal offense. That's the fifth and final thing. So in summary, what do we do on a proactive level? Christians, we don't attack people. We speak about issues. We don't try to shame a person to silence, but we will lovingly expose error. We do not leverage the masses. We leverage the truth. We do not confront persons publicly, but only privately if we have an actual relationship with them. We're not driven by personal vengeance or personal offense, but by God's will. That's biblical challenge versus unbiblical canceling. So if you, if you address issues publicly and persons privately, 99% of the time, you'll probably be at a really good track to, to walking uh, out this ethic. So what then if you become the recipient of cancel culture? And I certainly hope that that's not happening to you. 
But what if you do? How do we apply this passively? What if others start to accuse you, to, to shame you, to try to uh, silence you? Like, can you do anything? Do you do anything? Many times, people will say that Christians shouldn't defend themselves when this happens. And they'll say it because, you know, the prophecy about Jesus is that he didn't open his mouth before uh, his accusers, that he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And so they'll say that Christians, you shouldn't defend yourself. Uh, in truth, a little correction on this, Jesus actually did defend himself a lot. He did open his mouth in the face of accusation a lot, just not right then. Throughout his ministry, he always rebutted accusations, exposed their own errors in doing so. He did not keep his mouth shut. Stephen, the first martyr, was anything but silent in Acts chapter 8. Paul defended himself before many trials, many accusations. Defended himself against many accusers to the churches he was writing letters to. Actually, I can't think of a single biblical example of a hero of the faith who didn't defend themselves against false accusations by sharing the truth. Except Jesus when he was crucified. Why? Why? Why, do, why did people defend themselves? Well, allowing accusations to go unchecked, for mistruth to be spread, for lies to be unaddressed, that could harm the gospel. That's the number one reason why. It could undercut something that God's actually up to. Second, why did Jesus remain silent at this particular time? Why uniquely then? You know, throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus says over and over, my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. And during all of those times, he doesn't keep his mouth shut. He responds. He's not silent. But then right before his crucifixion, he says the hour has come. And once he says the hour has come, he's no longer responding to the accusations then. There's actually only one person he responded to in that whole episode, and it was Pilate, right? Pilate asked him if he was king of the Jews, and Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world. He did respond to Pilate in part. For everyone else, you know, Jesus had already said everything he came to say. He had already spoken all the things that needed to be said in response to their incessant accusations, but with Pilate, Pilate hadn't heard everything that Jesus has said. Pilate's wife had that dream not to participate in the murder of this man. And so Pilate, he ends up getting a level of response from Jesus at this time. And if you remember, whenever Pilate releases him to the crowd, he washes his hands and he says, I find no guilt in this man. But for everyone others, Jesus, all the others, Jesus did not open his mouth at the time of his crucifixion. That's part of the reason why also Part of the reason why is Jesus is not desperate and he's not panicky for his own preservation. He's come to do what he was sent to do. And that was to die for the sins of the world. All to say this was a unique situation. And so if you are the target of cancel culture, you can defend yourself. You can present facts in the face of false accusation. Don't counter accuse. Don't name call. Don't panic if that truth isn't received or accepted. It may not be. And just do all of it in the peace that God sees. Always remember, where there's not justice on earth, there might be later, and we all will stand before the throne. And God sees and he's just. There's just a time to just, don't be panicky in the face of it all. You are allowed to defend yourself with the facts, but keep those things in mind. Second, if you are standing on God's truth, and you're speaking God's truth, and that costs you. What does Jesus say about that? Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
Believer, the day is coming. It's now already here where your faith is going to cost you more explicitly than it's ever cost believers in our country before. And if you have an eternal perspective, you're not just here wanting to white knuckle a paycheck in the here and now, then you would actually prize an opportunity to suffer cost for your faith. When you suffer cost for your faith, what happens? Your reward is what? Great in heaven. So do you think that this reward Jesus speaks of is better than the paychecks you might have lost to gain it? I'm gonna ask that again. Do you think that the reward Jesus is talking about is actually better than the paychecks you might have lost in order to gain that reward? Yes. How much better? And can I ask you this? Do you think that that reward Jesus is talking about will last longer than the paychecks you may have lost to get it? My son's eating through my paycheck in like three days. So I know it lasts longer. If you lose your job, if you get rejected for university, if you get uh, blocked from promotions or something, whatever, because of your faith, do nothing less than believe what Jesus said and rejoice. Go home and have a party, gang. You just got an opportunity that not many American Christians have had since our country's inception, but many worldwide have. And I want you to know something. We have to have this perspective. The generation of young people in our midst need those that will go before them. They need someone to go first. They need to grow up hearing of the testimonies of those who stood up and those who were not willing to compromise to God and his word and who did lose their job and yet could testify, you know what? My God was with me and my God is my provider. The source of my paycheck wasn't that company. It was actually God who takes care of me. They need these people to go before them because the wave is just starting to splash us a little bit, but it will be full blown their whole adult lives most likely. Don't you know Stephen, the first martyr? That his faithfulness in the midst of martyrdom, it spurred so many other people along to not compromise, even if it cost their very own life. And do you understand that his testimony and the, the impact of it, it's still being credited to his eternal account. His reward is still growing to this day. Recognize that your faithfulness and your testimony as one of the first who would suffer cost and loss. It could be the same. I'm not saying like, you know, commit suicide by cop in the sense of like fired him by Christianity or something. I'm just saying don't compromise to avoid cost. Don't forget either your coworkers seeing you be willing to be fired for what you believe. To suffer cost and loss, that's a greater testimony than all the things that you could say or do in your time there. You see, titans, titans, church. Titans, church of the front range, cannot be canceled. Titans cannot be silenced by being canceled. They cannot fear being canceled. They do not compromise for concern of being canceled because God's the source of their security. They're not looking to some alternative source. It's him and he's not budging because their significance is in being faithful and nothing else. They're not tied to the achievements of this world because they know that blessing is nothing other than God himself, his presence, and his favor, nothing else. And they are out for one person's approval. They are out to not be canceled by one. It's him. Amen. Amen. You see, titans of the faith, they don't love the world. They don't love anything in this world. They're passing through this place. They're on a mission. They cannot be bullied, threatened, manipulated, pressed into compromise. Titans can't. And if you threaten their very lives, well, guess what? They're already dead. That won't work either. It hasn't worked on Titans of the faith for 2,000 years. Let it not start working now. Can I get an amen? I'm going to invite us to bow our heads and close our eyes as we 
prayerfully respond today. And Believer, I would just encourage you to take some time and pray. You don't want to be one who hears the word and walks away and doesn't apply it to your life. And as you do, I think that all of us, we tend to fall on kind of one of two ends of the spectrum. For some, maybe you've been engaged in cancel culture and you just need to get right before God and get reoriented about that. Others of you, my guess is the Holy Spirit's kind of bringing a level of conviction that maybe it's not been as public or it's been a little less formal, but that you actually have canceled someone. You've treated them less than made in his image. If that's true, would you repent of that? Now for others, perhaps it's on the other end of the spectrum and there's actually just been an absence of challenging biblically and appropriately because of potential cost or because of potential consequence. Would you listen to God? Would you step into the fullness of what he's calling you to today? As you're reflecting on that with God, I also just wanna speak to anyone else who's here. If, If you're here, you're listening online today and you've you never put your faith in Jesus Christ before. You've never decided to trust him as the, the one who can give you eternal life and forgive you of your sins. I, I want to share the good news with you today. You know, John 8, 24 in the Bible tells us something that's alarming, but it is true. Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. You see, the Bible is clear that all of us have sinned. We've all gotten it wrong. We've all been wrong. We've all done wrong. And the Bible is very clear that our sin, it, it brings about a separation from a sinless, holy God, from a perfect God, a righteous and pure God, who's also the source of life. And it tells us that our sin, it will separate us from God, but it will also separate us from all of eternity unless it's dealt with. And the problem is, is that none of us can deal with it on our own. We can't erase our sin on our own. And so God made a way. You see, Jesus, who is God, he left heaven and he came to earth. And he died on the cross and rose again. And he died in our place, in my place, in your place, for our sin. He paid our debt of death. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us. Because he loves you. This is something that no one else has done, no one else could do. When we place our faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Our past is wiped clean and we're brought into a relationship with God that starts now and it lasts forever. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He also says that he is standing at the door of our hearts and knocking. The question is, will you open the door for him? Will you choose him? Will you say yes to him? If that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking around, would you simply raise your hand as your way of saying, yeah, Jesus, your hand is extended to me. I want to extend mine back to you. I want to receive the forgiveness that you offer. I want to receive the eternal life and relationship with you that you've made available. Know this, our good works cannot save us. Being religious, it cannot save us. No one else, nothing else can save us. There's only one and that's Jesus and our acceptance of him and what he did. Is there anyone else who would say, Jesus, I choose you? I don't wanna leave this room without my eternity sure in you. If so, I would encourage you just to come and to pray with me and say, Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming to earth. Thank you for dying for my sin thank you for raising again. I confess that I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. 
Jesus, please forgive me. Do what only you can do. Save me. I give you my heart, my life. Please fill me with your spirit and lead me all the days of my life. Amen. Amen. Well, church family, we're going to end our service, as I said earlier, uh, celebrating those who have made the same decision that we were just talking about. And they're getting baptized as a declaration of that. So you're going to notice them getting into position now. You're going to notice our next gen uh, making their way into the room. They want to be with us to celebrate those that are getting uh, baptized as well. And as they do all of this briefly, uh, what is baptism? Baptism, uh, we always talk about it. It's the first step of obedience that someone takes when they choose to accept Jesus Christ for who he is and they accept what he's done for them. Uh, it's such the first step that often in scripture you'll actually read believe and be baptized. It's the very first thing to do. It's a public declaration of someone's faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's a time when we celebrate the testimony of people that have been washed clean, representing the forgiveness of all sins. Uh, it's a time that we celebrate that in Christ we die to our old self and we're actually raised in him to be a new creation in Christ. And so we're going to be celebrating baptism today. And, and as we do, let's just be sure that we celebrate with all of heaven, cheering along uh, those that have made this decision and have followed through on that decision with being baptized. Uh, I do want to say just something practical. If you have trouble seeing uh, the baptisms that are taking place uh, here in this stage, you can look to the screens. You'll be able to see them on the screens as well. Uh, and For those of you sitting right here front and center in the first few rows, uh, you'll definitely want to remain uh, seated if you can. I learned real quick that my big bald head was blocking everybody from uh, seeing the baptism. So uh, finally, if you're here and you have received Christ, but you haven't been baptized, what better day than today? We'd love to celebrate you being baptized too. You can actually just make your way right over here and we would love to baptize you as well. We do have a towel and a t-shirt that you could wear home that's dry and all of that. Let us celebrate some baptisms together now. My name is Rowan. I came to Jesus by praying and reading the Bible. I'm thankful that he died on the cross for my sins. I pray that my mommy and daddy will come to love Jesus as much as I do. Hi, my name's Natalia. Jesus, I want to get baptized because I trust Jesus as my savior. Because he died on the cross for my sins, helped me be brave and keep Satan away. I love Jesus. I'm Natalie Zabico. Jesus has forgiven me and loves me. I want to thank him for being my savior and for my family who love me and comfort me. I'm grateful that he is always with me. good let's pray for them together as a church family god in heaven we thank you for each and every one that you loved and god we know 
that if there was, if they were the only person on the planet that needing saving, you would have come for them. You would have died for them alone. And we thank you, God, for your great love extended to each. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have adopted them as sons, as daughters. And Lord, we know that the seed in their heart that's taking root and growing, God, we know that apart from your spirit, it cannot flourish to be all that you've intended it to be. And we are asking, would you fill them with your Holy Spirit again and again and again, Lord. We are praying for the rain of your spirit to fall upon the soil of their soul, for this seed to truly sprout and produce all the fruit that you have intended, God. We pray protection around the garden of their heart, Lord. We are praying against thorns and thistles and other things that compete with the flourishing God. We pray that the deceit of wealth, the desires of this world, we pray that anxieties and worries and other things would not be choking out the thing that you want to do in them. Please bless them. Please protect them. We love you and we thank you for this in Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen, amen. Awesome to be with you guys this weekend. Thanks for coming out for Baptism Weekend. As you're leaving, I hope you have a great day. And if you're here and you need prayer for healing, I mean, you guys are seeing the testimonies. God is healing people every single service around here right now. Uh, if you need prayer for heart healing, for something going on uh, otherwise in your life, we would love to be a part of praying for you. Uh, our pastoral leadership team and our prayer team will be back in that corner and we would love to do that. Thanks for listening. Take care, everybody. Blessings. Bye.